Great. Thanks very much, Gertie. I want to um, reiterate uh, the, the many thanks that, that Gertie offered uh, this morning. Um, I'm very, very excited and grateful to be speaking at the symposium. Uh, today I was at the one last year and I enjoyed it so much and I'm very buoyed by the, um, by the love of historical work that goes on uh, in, this, in this room and in these symposiums. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank uh, Linda Quinney for um, sort of partnering up and presenting this afternoon. And also, um, thanks to Dr. Lynham and Dr. McPherson for generously um, agreeing to act as commentators today. And of course, to all of you uh, for, for coming today. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, I want to linger a little bit on this title page, uh, this image, because I think in, in lots of ways it encapsulates many of the key ideas that um, I'm going to try to explore today. And undoubtedly I'm going to try to do too much, so um, apologies in advance, um, but hold on and we'll, we'll go through and see, see um, how much I can get done. Um, the image is from the 1940s and it depicts a scene in one of the many uh, child welfare or well baby clinics um, that could be found in lots, most uh, large Canadian cities at the time. This particular picture is taken in Toronto, but they could also be found, of course, in Vancouver, Montreal, Halifax. Um, well, baby clinics were initiated um, across the country earlier in the century as public health uh, infrastructure was established and really ramped up. They were part of the response, of course, to the high rates of infant mortality um, that plagued the country early in, this, in the century. So we have here this sort of triangular scene with a happy mother um, supporting her young child. It looks like um, maybe a little boy uh, and an equally happy nurse or doctor um, ready to administer a needle and possibly a vaccination of some kind. We might note that all the attention um, is focused on the child and like the gaze of the two women, our eyes are also, the viewer's eyes are also drawn to him. And he is, um, he's about to get a needle in the towel is kind of shielding uh, his, his arm a bit, possibly acting as a way to try to distract him from that moment when the needle goes in and presumably there's pain and, and tears. Uh, the scene is also punctuated by, um, by sort of the accoutrement of medical science. So we get this, um, it might be an equipment bag. I'm not quite sure what that is and then maybe someone can tell me what that is in the background. Um, measuring equipment, a vial of serum, and these are all at the practitioner's disposal. Uh, the scene is enveloped in white. There's a white curtain at the back. Um, the, the procedure's happening on these clean white sheets. And of course, the practitioner is wearing a white uniform, all suggesting attention to a very sterile environment, um, to exemplary hygiene, to cleanliness. So this photograph and hundreds, if not thousands of others that promoted these kind of health um, interventions into child rearing invite, I think, really multiple layers of analysis, of course. Uh, it suggests that a concerted effort on the part of government and, and or the medical establishment was made to promote traditional Western medicine as sort of the arbitrator uh, of healthy bodies in modernizing Canada. Uh, it was certainly not something to be left up to this mother um, or to other sort of lay practitioners. That was made clear time and time again um, before and during this period. It also speaks to very complex role of gender um, going on here, specifically the role, of course, of women in shaping this development. It suggests that women were expected to sort of continue to fulfill these traditional roles as, as mothers and caregivers to, um, to young children in the period, but they were you know, also to happily sort of give over some of this uh, work to, to professionals. Uh, it also makes clear that professionals who were also also often women um, in these capacities, presumably challenging traditional or st stereotypical sort of gender role um, norms, uh, particularly during wartime when um, women often quite seamlessly uh, walked into the roles of men, if only for the duration of, of the war. Uh, but in fact, the historical question that, that I've taken up in my research agenda, and, and Gertsche um, alluded to it, and one that's I think often overlooked in broader histories of um, the medical professions in the Canadian context um, has to do with this. How did that, that youngster make a difference in the picture um, as the figurative object of the medical gaze and as the, the quite literal 
on the quite literal receiving end of, of that needle. Um, how did children contribute to the history unfolding in this picture? So in my presentation, I'd like to offer um, some of the main findings um, of my work on children's medical treatment over the sort of early to mid 20th century. I'd like to try to bring this history perhaps a bit more explicitly into conversation with the history of medicine and the history of, of nursing. So just let me give you, a, uh, Gertie mentioned it, but just give you a quick sense of um, acknowledging that my presentation is sort of based on two um, fairly recently published works. And the first one, Lost Bodies, Lost Voices, Doctors in the Embodiment of Children and Youth in English Canada from the 1900s to the 1940s, appeared um, in an edited collection in 2012. That's the reading that the commentators um, read for today. Um, and the second resource that I'm going to draw upon uh, is, is the book, uh, Small Matters, uh, Canadian Children in Sickness and Health, 1900 to 1940. It was published last year by, by McGill Queens. So I'll try to do the, this. I'll try to answer these questions by sort of, or, or rather I'll try to, to present this overview, overview by focusing on three main questions that I've, I've sort of gravitated to time and time again in my own research. And the first one is, what were professional attitudes towards the healthy child in the early 20th century, and how and why did they change over time? The second question that I've tried to get a handle on is, what did these changes in attitudes towards healthy children mean for children's treatment and for practitioners and other experts, including nurses and educators? And finally, um, perhaps the hardest question to answer in some ways, how did children and their families respond to this? So along the way, and this is where it gets very ambitious, Along the way, I'll try to weave in information about my historical sources. So what did I draw upon um, to try to provide some answers or responses to my questions? So historical sources. And also, I'll try to weave in important historiographical, sorry, it's a little low, histori historiographical, um, theoretical, and methodological considerations. And the theoretical considerations I'll sort of leave until the very sort of end of the, end of the presentation. By the time I get there, you will probably have guessed where, what my theoretical bent is on some of this stuff. So at the turn of the century, you know, babies and young children were, of course, a problem uh, for medical practitioners. Um, and this had to do with, of course, the very high rate of infant mortality. Approximately one out of every five to seven babies born at the turn of the century died within the first year or two of, of life. Um, and this was widely acknowledged, interestingly, uh, in, the in, in the country as a, as a tragedy, um, but it wasn't yet really positioned as a problem or that a problem that a broad sort of uh, response was, was needed to. This really changed um, during, after the First World War. Um, after the First World War, this idea of resignation about child death was no longer, uh, no longer acceptable. Um, there, I think there was a convergence of social factors that contributed to this change in attitude. It wasn't just one thing. Um, you know, it, can, modernizing Canada was um, a really changing place at the turn of the century. It was urbanizing quite rapidly. It was huge influx of immigrants. There was great uh, middle-class anxiety about what was perceived to be a, a dropping birth rate um, amongst the middle class and an increasing birth rate um, amongst the immigrant classes. There was eugenics thinking was kicking in. Um, so there was a great deal of contestation in the country at the time. There was also, uh, I think, running within and parallel to this, uh, was a concerted effort amongst the medical establishment, a quite aggressive uh, push to, to be seen as the professionals, to be seen as the, the um, professionals, the scientific professionals who uh, should have domain over health care, should have domain over, over um, child care. Um, in this sort of heady mix in Canada came the, uh, the really uh, quite concerted, you know, uh, rise of pediatrics during this time. So um, prior to the sort of the early, early decades of the 20th century, pediatrics was not um, seen as a very legitimate uh, kind of specialization. Um, after, the sec after the First World War and claims that infant mortality could be brought into um, line if people would just listen 
to doctors. Uh, pediatrics uh, became um, much, much more acceptable um, and doctors uh, increasingly claimed pediatrics as their profession. This is um, uh, an image from the National Archives. Uh, it's a nurse and orderly transporting a child on a stretcher for the operating room at the Hospital for Sick Children, and this was about 19, 1910. So medical professionals then dedicated to saving babies stressed babies' vulnerability to early death and contagious diseases, and they knew what they were talking about. There was a lot of early death. Uh, small bodies then became very problematic bodies for, for doctors. Um, and I want to read a quote from a textbook um, published at the turn of the century and used in Canadian medical schools uh, right up until like, the 1930s, um, uh, which exemplifies this construction of children as a problem for doctors and nurses to solve. Um, and so this sort of uh, gives me a piece of, of the discursive landscape I'm trying to map out about how doctors thought about young bodies. So this is Kenneth Fenwick. Um, Manual of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Pediatrics. In childhood, the, the tissues are softer, more vascular, and more succulent. The glandular, lymphatic, and capillary systems are extremely active. The skin and mucous membranes are softer, more delicate, more sensitive. The brain is large, vascular, and almost fluid in consistency. There is excessive nervous excitability due to want of controlling power. And the reflex sensibility is excessively acute. <laughs> so you, know, you get this sense reading this that um, these are like little bundles that could literally like explode at any moment. Um, they're, 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 you know, they're highly, highly uh, volatile in a sense. Um, and and I, you know, Fenwick's take on, on the, the infant body is repeated over and over again in, in multiple sources. Um, so... Three descriptors keep coming up time and time again in the professional literature about, doc about kids, young people. Um, they're very vulnerable, they're extremely unpredictable, and um, they're dangerous. <laughs> and this last descriptor, dangerous, um, is a particularly interesting one, um, that children's bodies were often described as dangerous by medical professionals. It, it was in the sense that they could be gripped by menacing diseases at any point, uh, not to mention succumbing to death. And, you know, this was a very uh, legitimate concern. So heading off this volatility, heading off this child death um, by, for example, instituting school health nursing, which is what picture we have um, here, became a priority, a medical, a very um, uh, pointed medical priority. And it's during this time that we see this triumph of kind of the medicalized model of childhood, that, that infancy and childhood were a time when interventions among, uh, um, from professionals was uh, the only right thing to do. So here's another example um, that I want to give you of this discursive landscape, not from a textbook this time, but from the professional journals. And again, uh, Smith's comment, um, I think, really exemplifies. I tried to pick out a very exemplary example of um, what were doctors learning from other doctors. Um, so, you know, according to Smith, anatomically, the infant lends itself to infection. The organs are small and almost fragile. The distance from the nose to the lung is very short. The physiological and mechanical resistance to becoming infection is slight. So note here how um, Smith's characterization characterizes children really in complete counter-distinction to adults. Um, so he gives us a sense that small bodies are sort of, by their very um, definition, pathological bodies. So from the discursive landscape, you know, shaped by professionals, the healthy child in, in early 20th century was, of course, vulnerable uh, and dangerous. Those are the two words that keep coming up time and again. Um, a key task was to uh, really change parental behavior, particularly mother's behavior, um, in the realm of healthcare. And perhaps not surprisingly, advertisers took full advantage um, of this, of new demands on mothers in particular to ensure children's health, to listen to the professionals and do what they were told. Um, this ad for Viral from 1924 plays on fears of child death. It's interesting, more boy babies die than girls. I don't know if that's, I haven't looked up, I haven't seen, I didn't, know about this ad when I was writing my book. 
So I wish I had, because I would have gone in there and tried to figure that if that's true or not. Maybe more boy babies were, were being born. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, be specific, especially careful of your b a baby boy. Arrest wasting. Protect his little life by giving virile. Um, so, you know, mothers are supposed to raise their babies with all the benefits of science and to take advantage of the ease of prepared foods, a sort of modern idea. Um, but it's interesting, you know, hand in hand with this, uh, sort of putting scientific thinking on a pedestal was a disparagement, the real disparagement um, of, of anything that smacked of home remedies, of anything that was a traditional approach to health and healing, uh, folk wisdom. Um, all of it was seen as not only a threat to medical hegemony, uh, traditional Western approaches, but it was also, you know, labeled as quackery. So you see that in the literature also. Please, you know, avoid quack, quackery. Um, Again, this is from uh, McLean's 1924. If you're interested, uh, Cheryl Walsh has a wonderful chapter on uh, food advertising and health for kids in the early 20th century. And I can, um, that's part of the um, citation. I can certainly share that with you if you're interested. So, you know, what about children themselves? Were they merely objects of or, um, you know, sort of subjects shaping this history? Uh, in my own research, I've sought out young people's perspe perspectives primarily through oral history interviews with adults. Um, for my book project, for example, 60 oral history interviews uh, were conducted with men and women from around the, the country and who grew up in Canada. Um, and, you know, why interviews? Uh, well, children, of course, and this is one of these um, methodological conundrums, um, children leave little traces of their lives uh, behind. And so memories of um, childhood become incredibly valuable um, for historians. Uh, it, you know, but it's a methodological problem for us. Um, oral histories have, the, have dangers of their own. Um, they risk reflecting a life recreated rather than a life uh, remembered. Um, they nevertheless have the potential uh, to be very valuable in some ways to balance other kinds of voices or to you know, encourage us to ask different kinds of questions, um, voices of, of adults that, that really dominate um, historical analysis. So I've, and I've included some of these um, anonymized data um, in, in the talk today. Um, so while, while medical professionals then warned Canadians against the use of folk remedies or home remedies, uh, you know, many oral history participants, just almost pretty much all of them, had vivid memories of these. These are really what stood out for them in terms of what it did mean to be healthy and grow up to be healthy as, as a young child. Um, domestic doctoring was very much alive in this period, and it continued to matter in families. Uh, and this complicates, of course, these straightforward constructions of children as simply vulnerable or mothers as simply compliant uh, with the experts. Um, so if Jean Tierney, for example, born in 1906 in um, Gladstone, Manitoba, had a tummy ache, for example, her mother would um, tell her to put some salt in her hands and lick it a little bit, and she said that really worked, made her feel much better. Um, born in 1910 in Nova Scotia, Lottie Black remembered wearing a camphor bag around her neck during the Spanish influenza of 1918, um, the outbreak. And, you know, after that outbreak, she concluded every winter almost we wore that little bag of camphor around our necks, and we were healthy. We never had colds or anything. Um, in 1915, Dorothea Ingram, who was born in, um, in Vancouver in 1907, contracted diphtheria. Her family was uh, quarantined, um, but, and she remembers this big red card going on her front door with diphtheria on it. Um, and she told me about a conversation that over the backyard fence that she had, her mother had with her family's neighbor, clearly breaking quarantine, which happened all the time as well. Um, and the, the neighbor said, I have, I have an idea to help Dorothea, can I? Can I come in and do my thing? And the mother's like, oh, yes, please, please come on over and do it. So the neighbor came over, and uh, Dorothea said um, she came over, and she had a big white feather, a chicken feather, like, and a bottle of brandy. And she came over and painted um, all my tonsil and in the, in the inside of my mouth with it. And my mother said it just brought back new life to me. So, you know, clearly, when we, in, when we include, yeah, when we include... We include adult memories. When adults remember what it was like when they were children, very interesting kind of dynamics inter enter into the mix. So consider um, this quotation by uh, Agnes Brennan, um, who was born in 1910. I remember growing up with polio. 
Uh, she said, um, there was this woman that used to come to the house. I think I was about four years old. She used to come on the streetcar and she had a black box with her and it was full of wires and I was scared to death of it. And she would wind this all around my leg and then she would plug it in into the electricity. So there was this electro, um, this fad around this electro power that would sort of hopefully stimulate muscles in the legs. Um, so healthcare strategies then in, uh, amongst families were complex. They varied. Um, experts had definitely had considerable social power I think we'd be foolish to think that they, they didn't. Um, however, they had to compete with other kinds of treatments. Um, I think it's also critical to acknowledge that race, class, and gender, and other markers of identity deeply and profoundly uh, shape the history of children's medical experiences. Many Aboriginal children uh, who were placed in residential schools, for example, certainly did not simply benefit from increasing attention um, from white practitioners. Um, nor were traditional approaches to health and healing encouraged or even accepted. Uh, Aboriginal children in, in um, residential schools were often the objects of unwanted um, attention. The work of Ian Mosby recently in the um, nutrition experiments and starvation experiments in residential schools, for example. Um, the, this is a photograph of, of Blackfoot children in Old Sun Residential School in the 1940s in, in, in um, Glashen, Alberta. And, of course, so far the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission has um, found that over 4,000 children died in residential schools, and, and that number is undoubtedly um, underreported. Uh, so Aboriginal children were mistreated, but they, were, they also often went wanting for appropriate kinds of Western interventions. Um, Florence Moffat, who was a nurse at R.W. Large um, Memorial Hospital on Campbell Island, reported in the 1940s, quote, that there was no doctor at the Indian villages of Klemtu and Kitimat, and these places were not receiving much in the way of medical attention. When she visited these neglected uh, villages, uh, Florence struggled, often very unsuccessfully, to help uh, keep her patients alive. Uh, quote, I treated more than 40 people with penicillin and mild sedatives. One young girl had a severe ear infection following a mastoid operation. I had taken her to the hospital, but the inf infection had been too severe and too long-lasting, and she died shortly, shortly afterwards. In her oral uh, history interview, um, Lily King from uh, Deseronto uh, Reservation, in, uh, it was called that, in Ontario, uh, recalled really very dubious treatment uh, in her Aboriginal day school, this time from a teacher who was hoping to instill lessons about personal hygiene, which were quite common um, at this time. Uh, instead, Lily recalled that she, uh, you know, associated indigeneity with, uh, with shame and with sadness. She said, um, I went to the school, there was this boy in the school who was very, very dirty. And, you know, I thought the most humiliating thing when I got older, the teacher couldn't stand it, so she got a tub of water and we would all take turns washing him, his back and his hair. Isn't that awful? Oh, he didn't have his clothes off, he had his underwear on, but kind of ridiculous. And oh, I used to think as I got older, that was a really awful thing to do to him. So embarrassing. So young people's perspectives, or adults remembering what it was like to be young, on their experience, they suggest that not only that race made a difference, um, you know, also class and gender and other markers of social identity, but that adults themselves, um, would, you know, sort of directly uh, were responsible for often notions of children's vulnerability. They made children vulnerable by the way they... Um, engaged in, in their treatment, for example. So for the, the last part of um, the presentation, I just want to focus in on how um, a growing awareness of children's sort of unique needs as patients in hospitals shifted nursing practice and vice versa in this period. Um, a focus on uh, changes in uh, pa uh, visitation rules for patients um, provides, I think, kind of an interesting little case study. Um, in the early decades of the, the 20th century, it was common for children's hospitals or children's wards, of course, to severely restrict um, patient visitations. And, and children would often stay in hospital for uh, a very long time, you know, years sometimes. Um, and, you know, such, such restrictions were placed on, on these visitations because of a number of sort of assumptions. One assumption um, in the literature was that there was this belief that 
uh, children would become accustomed to um, sort of hospitalization more readily if family visits were infrequent and short. Uh, and second, you know, there was a very real concern about restricting um, infectious disease uh, vectors. Um, it's also, I think, important to note that um, it was difficult often for families who, who might live quite far away from a hospital to visit their kids every day. Uh, farm families, I have testimony from, um, from people who are saying, I, I wanted to go, but I just, I couldn't. I was the only one at home, large family, working class family. So it was a difficult time to be, to be hospitalized in some ways. Um, for much of the 1930s, uh, standard practice, for example, at Toronto Sick, uh, sick Kids Hospital, Hospital for Sick Children, um, saw visitation for public ward patients, which are far the majority of children patients were, were in public wards, limited to one hour on Sunday afternoons. Uh, so um, parents often viewed their hospitalized babies through a window, or they would be allowed to sit beside their older children, but very, very rarely uh, did they have access to medical staff while they were, while they were there. So they didn't get to ask a lot of questions about their, their children's care. Um, nursing historian Judith Young, quoting a pediatric resident from uh, Toronto Sick Kids Hospital in 1935, said that children's treatment, the children's treatment system there um, was, quote, like a Chinese laundry, where packages were left and then picked up by the parent when treatment was, was complete. Um, despite efforts by uh, nursing staff and junior physicians, often who linked up, kind of an interesting um, coalition there, to expand nursing hours. And they had behind them research at this, you know, at this seemingly early point that suggested that psychologically it was very damaging for, ki for kids to be separated from their family for such long periods. Do established doctors and hospital managers really resisted this change. Um, daily visiting on the public wards was not introduced at the hospital for sick kids, for example, until 1961, and even later at St. Justine Hospital in Montreal, which was a, a, leading, a leading hospital, and all day visiting did not begin in Toronto until 1965. Um, and, you know, of course, oral history, uh, this is the, a patient ward at the um, sanitarium in, um, sorry, sanatorium, Freudian slip, uh, in Alberta in 1927. Um, oral history interviews, again, suggest, suggest this vulnerability piece and adults' role in contributing to it. Um, so, so Sheila had quite traumatic memories of being hospitalized in the 1940s. And again, these, these memories are often repeated over and over, particularly the bright lights and the smells. It's so interesting. They, they're repeated. So I saw them in the morning come in and put me in my little white gown, and I'll never forget that. So just think while, while I'm reading this how much has changed over time. They put me in a bed, and you didn't have Valiums or whatever it is they give to kids to calm you down. Uh, they just rolled me into a room with big, bright lights. They were big, like floodlights, and they put this thing on my face, this huge mask. And I remember the smell of ether, and to this day, I cannot stand the smell of ether. And so lots of people have memories of not, not digging the ether. Um, and I think partly was also the fact that there wasn't a, um, there was no attention paid to, at this, t at this time, um, to a, a, patient's, a young patient's right to know what was happening to them or what their care, what, what direction their care was going in. Um, and that had to do uh, with, again, attitudes towards children at this time uh, and, you know, practitioners reflecting those broader social attitudes towards, towards children. So nursing practice was shifting in this period quite, quite dramatically in order to respond to the needs of the young, however. And I mentioned that the, um, the advocate, nurses advocating for a change. Uh, in the late 1930s, uh, the Children's Memorial Hospital of Montreal developed a new branch of its nursing service called recreational therapy. Um, and, you know, writing in the Canadian Nurse in 1937, the Canadian Nurse, of course, a very um, prominent uh, nursing journal over the 20th century, uh, Alice Burkhart explained that, um, quote, its chief function is to educate nursing staff to the use of play as a mean of, means of facilitating nursing procedure and to create, through play with children, um, the normal environment to which every child is entitled. Um, according to Burkhart, play therapy for children helped nurses too, of course. Uh, it made children happier. It made them more compliant uh, and, and cheerful, cooperative with their, with their treatments. It would take, though, another... 
um, 20 years or more uh, until play therapy was officially recognized as, as an important element in care for young patients. But nurses were really at the forefront um, of advocating for play as a way to improve practice uh, with pediatric patients. So change was coming. Um, nurses continued through the, throughout this period. One could do a whole thesis, doctoral students, on uh, children, uh, nurse and play therapy and ch child's health. Um, I haven't checked them, maybe competing theses, but we could fit something in there. Um, so nurses continued to write in these leading journals about the needs to do things like, you know, and this is in the 30s and 40s and 50s, quote, give the child a change of scene. Take him out of the environment of illness and provide an opportunity for social contact with other boys and girls. So here's a picture of young patients at Halifax Children's Hospital um, in the 19, uh, late 1940s. The other thing that is, is sort of interesting to keep in mind is that, um, you know, Sometimes the professional, of course, the professional um, textbooks and journal articles fall way behind what's actually happening in practice, as we all sort of know. So you can find these pictures uh, and, and testimony from people when, you know, engaging in a particular kind of therapy or having memories around a particular procedure that apparently wasn't supposed to be happening at that time. So um, it makes it more complicated, but also kind of exciting. Um, so I want to... Um, just conclude, wrap up my presentation by making more explicit two sort of theoretical concepts that have guided the work. Um, and um, Gertsche alluded to uh, one of the, a very important one for me is age as a um, category of, of analysis. And the second is Michel Foucault's notion of, of biopower. Both of these have shaped my thinking about how children matter in the history of nursing and the history of the medical professions. Um, I have to sort of say that um, I think a light kind of went on in my own thinking when I read sociologist Barry Thorne's take on the importance of being attentive to age as socially constructed. So she wrote that, like gender, racial ethnicity, and sexuality, age is an embodied form of difference. And that phrase really struck me. Age is an embodied form of difference that is both materially and discursively produced and embedded in relations of power um, and authority. The idea of age as a form of, of difference produced by adults was certainly what I found in um, my, my research on um, children's treatment uh, by medical professionals. While many children, of course, benefited from specialized medical attention, particularly in the areas of you know, uh, infant mortality, disease control, um, their characterization as vulnerable and even dangerous was not wholly positive for all children over the century, particularly as the oral um, histories testify. Nurses contributed to the medicalization of childhood. They helped entrench the authority of the medical gaze. They also challenged it um, by attempting to bring sensitivity to the needs of young patients uh, and to make this a part of affecting, effective nursing practice. Um, balancing happy child patients and docile patients um, was a, an act that all nurses, I think, during this period, if not still contemporarily, need to engage uh, with. Um, and here, I think, uh, my work confirms Michel Foucault's um, concept of biopower, as it, was, as it has been explained, I think, quite usefully by um, Denise Gastaldo. Uh, she wrote, um, focusing on individual bodies or on the social body Health professionals are entitled by scientific knowledge and power to examine, interview, and prescribe healthy lifestyles. The clinical gaze is omnipresent and acceptable because its object is to promote health as well as to promote a disciplinary um, society. So um, medical professionals helped produce conceptions of children as different from adults uh, and, in, and in need of specialized attention. And children and their families responded to this activity in complex ways. They were certainly objects of adult power, uh, but they were never only that. Thank you.
I was just uh, thank you very much. That was fascinating. And um, I was in hospital at Vancouver Children's in the forties, so oh. <laughs> I'm on the edge of your research. Um, what were your <laughs> yeah? What were your primary um, sources of, of data? So you made reference to the Canadian nurse. Yeah. So, so I um, I examined. Uh, medical textbooks used in schools. I examined um, nursing and doctor uh, professional journals, Canadian Medical Association Journal. Um, I went to uh, Toronto uh, Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and got access to their patient records. Um, I did the, you know, of course the, the oral history interviews. Um, so they were primarily text-based and uh, oral history interview based. Um, it's it's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Not a lot of work has been done on children's contributions to uh, medical thinking in Canada. Lots of stuff has been well, lots some stuff has been done internationally. But I I was paralyzed by how much stuff there is, and so I I you mean the potential? Yeah, like so many questions came up that I just couldn't. I just couldn't. I mean, I had files, cabinets, and file cabinets of. You know, I kind of went down the whole road of particular disease. Um, so I'd have a whole file on polio and a whole file on lice and a whole file on... And, and then, you know, the other side was... Um, I didn't get to talk about a lot today, um, is the educator side. So um, I was also very interested in how children learn to be healthy in schools. So the medical uh, practitioner, uh, families and children piece is only about one half. The other half that I'm really interested in is how do teachers and educators um, and school health nurses. Um, how did they make do in schools when so much was going on? Uh, what was the health curriculum like at this time? Uh, what were the um, what were the pressures to try to um, keep children healthy in schools that were incredibly unhealthy, for example? Um, and and trying to be attentive to um, things like uh, people who are labeled with disabilities. So I tried to pay attention to that in, in a chapter in the, in the book. Uh, people who um, racialized, um, getting oral history interviews from a range of, of perspectives and not just, you know. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's just there's so much material that, you know, it could write books and books and books about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I hope you keep doing that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.